All right. Good morning, afternoon. I guess we're right at noon here. So hope everyone's having a, <clears throat> a great free Thanksgiving week. This is Kim Ernstrom, and I am one of the technical leads with the IFTDIS team. And with me today is Josh Hyde. So let me go ahead and put my screen into presentation mode here. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we've got an hour. We want to try to leave a, a little bit of time at the end just to wrap everything up. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in and, and show you all what we've got for an agenda. And, um, and Josh, if there's any issues with not being able to hear me, um, let me know. All right. Okay. So here we are. We're here for the IFTDIS uh, Interagency Fuels Treatment Decision Support um system and uh we've decided to do a little update on what we've got going on as far as what's available in if for um for folks to use um what kind of functionality we have and uh and then where we're going and then where you can learn more about about if we've started development back in um april our first release was in april of 2017 so we've been at this for a little while, and Nifty Disk has certainly grown since April of that of 2017. So we felt it was a good time to catch everybody up on where we're at, uh, what, we, what we're developing right now, and then what's going to happen in the future. And then, Josh, the second part of this is we just released the map values functionality in the application. That was released in October, and we hadn't had a chance to really demo that to everybody. So we thought this would be a good opportunity um, to do a demo of that feature um, and show you how it sort of rolls into the rest of the application. So that's our outline for today, and um, and we'll uh, we'll try to stick to that and stick to an hour here. So I wanted to quickly go over who who is using IFTDIS. We've had uh, over 1,750 accounts in the system since our launch in 2017, and you can kind of see the breakdown of uh, of where we're at as far as folks. Um, out in the world who are who are using are using the application. So we've got 70% um, of all of our government agencies are are uh, federal fire agencies, and then quite a few non-government folks. And we if this is open to everybody, um, anybody who would like to have an account can get one, and um, and we expect that to stay that way. We have no no plans to change that at all, and uh, we're excited to have have such a diverse group of of folks. So that's been that's been really great. Next slide is uh, what we're, what people are using IFTDIS for. And we've got quite a diversity of folks. We've heard from folks. Um, some folks have shared their, their projects with us. And just through questions we get through the user community, um, we can kind of see what folks are, are using things for. So you can see the list here. Everything from, from NEPA to uh, teaching IFTDIS in university classes um, to doing multi-year uh, fuels planning. Um, all kinds of things, community wildfire protection plans. So it's a great diversity. We're really glad to see this. And um, we'd love to know what 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 other folks are using IFTDIS for um, or what you would like to use it for if, if you're brand new to the application. So um, I think what we're going to do in the new year, and I'll show you on the IFTDIS homepage, um, we'll have some places on the landing page for you all to um, Communicate with us, basically, and uh, maybe some more. We have we've had a user survey out, but we'll probably update that, and um, and then and see if we can solicit some more ideas on on how you're using the application because we we do want to know how it's being used. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some ways that you can communicate with us through our user forums, etc. Okay, so uh, so what I want to do is go through what, and this is going to be a pretty quick snapshot of some screen captures on what if you just can do now so this is if you were to log into the application today these are the, some of the things that you could that you could actually do in the application and then the second half of this we'll talk about what we're developing so right now if you just has a um, quite an extensive set of uh of data if you go into our map studio um, which is where we display all the map images and all of our reference data you will see um this, this pop-up screen here where it says add layers is where all of the, the reference data lives. And it's, it's, if you're familiar with, with WIFDIS, the wildfire decision support system, um, 
it's, we're trying to match up the data layers that are available in WIFDIS with IFTDIS. So, um, and adding some additional things too that maybe relate a little more specifically to fuels treatments and uh, fuels planning. So we've got a great reference data set in there. Um, we've also got the ability to upload and save and edit your own shape files. So if the reference data isn't cutting it for you, then we've got the ability to upload, um, upload your own data. And there is a limit to the complexity of the data sets that you can upload. Um, and you can read about that in the online help that'll explain um, on how you limit the complexity of your shape file. But you can, you can upload your own shape files. When you do that, um, you're able to select the attributes that you want to view on your screen and then uh, display those attributes in the system. So you can upload and, and uh, use your own shape files. I am not a GIS person, so for me, um, some of this functionality is sort of a GIS light, if you will. We are using a, a modified version of ArcGIS online in order to, uh, uh, as, as far as the interface goes. So that might be familiar to some of you who, who use ArcGIS online. IFTDIS can also, um, one of the, the key points of IFTDIS is being able to um, utilize land fire data. And currently we have the 2014 land fire data sets available in IFTDIS. We are going to be releasing the 2016, which is the new remap uh, land fire data, and that we'll have that in the system sometime in January. A lot of people have been asking about the new um, the new land fire data, so that'll be available come January. Um, and within IFTDIS, you can create landscapes. Um, you can up, we can do up to um, three and a half million acres at this point. Um, and then you can go in there and edit those landscapes. You can make adjustments based on uh, anything, uh, disturbance that's happened on that landscape, or if you just know that there's some typical adjustments that you need to make for doing modeling, um, or even gaming out different scenarios. So that's um, one of the key features of IFTDIS is to generate and then edit those landscapes. This is just a screen capture of, of doing that, that development of the landscape, generating that landscape, and how it looks in the application. Um, when you draw your box, IFTDIS will go out and grab that data and then display it on the map uh, with a legend. And you can you can look at the, all the all the different um, layers of the LCP, elevation, slope, aspect, fuel model, et cetera. So that's how that looks in the system. So as far as the editing of the landscapes, we've got a couple different ways that you can do landscape editing. Um, the first the first way that it might be familiar to folks, especially if you've used WIFDIS before in editing landscapes, is this user created edit rule. And this is sort of the way it's basically manually editing your landscape, where you pick the attribute, you decide on how you're going to adjust that, and then what you want the new attribute to be. So if you're doing fuel models, for example, in this case, you've got, you're picking your fuel model um, on a slope that is less than 30%. And this is the fuel model you want to adjust, which is our 161. Um, and then we can adjust uh, either that fuel model, you can change it to another fuel model. In this example, we're actually adjusting the canopy cover just for that fuel model by 25%. So there's all different kinds of ways that users can create their own rules for adjusting um, land fire data. And we do this commonly, you know, when you're, when you're modeling fire behavior, um, you're trying to game out uh, maybe bug kill or um, maybe there's been a disturbance and you know it's not reflected in the land fire data, but you want to go in and make that adjustment um, so you can do the modeling based on current conditions. So that's one way to use the, um, the, the editing rules here. The second way is uh, we have gathered from uh, land fire some prepackaged disturbance rules that they use when they are developing their land fire data. And we've put those rules into a uh, into a drop down menu where you can select different types of of disturbance, and and then it will apply those those prepackaged rules to your to your landscape. And all of the technical documentation on these prepackaged land fire rules is, is available in the help system. So if you're curious on what a light thinning is or a, a clear cut looks like and what rules uh, land fire is applying the best thing to do is go to the help documentation 
and then and then read about how that um, how those how those crosswalks are being done um, in, in those rules. And I, I do recommend you read read about that a little bit rather than just using those rules sort of um, without without understanding exactly what's going on behind the scenes. But it's a great way just to kind of get started and try to make some adjustments if you're not quite sure where to start. So two ways to, to edit landscapes in IFTDIS. Okay, so then, so that's editing our landscape. So once we've done that, and then we're working off the, you know, the IFTDIS uh, planning cycle is what we call the, the, the this image on the left here. So we've got our landscape evaluation piece, which is creating, editing um, our landscapes. Then we also can, can start modeling fire behavior in that landscape evaluation piece. When you're just trying to maybe just get familiar with what you have on the land, on the, on the landscape. Um, so we've got three ways we can, or two ways right now that we can model fire behavior. We can use the um, the, the basic uh, landscape fire behavior, which is basic SLAM map, which is essentially takes uh, you know our our outputs we would see and behave before we had SLAM map, and SLAM map puts that on a map so you can look at the pixels um, in a spatial in a spatial setting. So. Um, it's a really quick and dirty way to get an idea of what kind of fire behavior under different conditions exists on your landscape. Um, one of the things, and I'll, I'll go in just a little more detail here, is, is the uh, is the automatic um, 97th percentile uh, fire behavior that runs off of that basic flam map um, fire behavior. So I'll show you that here in just a second. The second thing we've added as far as fire behavior models is landscape probability. And um, that's going to be used when we go into some of the risk assessment, uh, the exposure analysis, and uh, some of the more um, some of the more detailed analysis as we as we get into the the more advanced features of IFTDIS. So, two models right now. It's different landscape probability, and again, this, this is all documented in the help system, and we really encourage everybody to take a look at that and understand how these models um, were were uh, were put into IFTDIS. Um, people do ask, is that the same thing as FSIM? And the answer is no, it's not FSIM. Um, it's it's a, a model that comes actually from FlamApp desktop model, um, and you can we've adapted that for uh, for use in IFTDIS. So so take a look at some of the documentation there if you're curious about the technical details behind these models. The third one that's not um, available yet, but we hope to make it available in 2020 is the minimum travel time model from FlamMap. And if you're familiar with WIFTIS, that would be the short-term model in WIFTIS. So we're hoping to, uh, to, to expose that to users um, sometime in 2020, and we'll keep you posted on when that will be available. So we think that's gonna be a really useful tool for folks for prescribed fire planning and, and gaming out different um, you know, fuels treatment uh, scenarios, et cetera. So we're hoping to have that um, uh, next year sometime. Okay, so this is just a few screenshots I wanted to show you of the, this is the basic landscape uh, fire behavior output. And um, in this case, I was I was using this to help explain to somebody how you can use this to write a burn plan. And um, so I've got two different layers on the screen. The one that's more green, the layer that's underneath here, is sort of would be the low end of my prescription. And then the, the layer that's on top here that's using the swipe tool um, would be the high end of my prescription. And this is a way that you could use this in a burn plan and sort of game out different prescription parameters and actually show, show that on a map rather than just use um, sort of the analog outputs that we get from behave. Um, so this is, this is one way that this, this type of fire behavior could be used. And we've got um, a couple little nice tools in IFTDIS, the swipe tool, um, which you use uh, in the upper right-hand corner here in order to access that swipe tool. It brings up this uh, this arrow that you can then scroll up and down and look at the layers that are on top of each other. And then the other tool is the identify tool, which is the little eye, and you can click anywhere on your landscape and then get the uh, particulars about that um, about that layer or any of the layers below it. So in this case, it's looking at fire behavior but it could also pull it pulls up the fuel model and then any other information from that point on the map. So a couple nice little tools within the map studio to help uh, manipulate some of those layers. 
And then this is what I was talking about on the, uh, the automatic 97th percentile um, report. So one of the things we wanted to do in the landscape evaluation part of IFIDIS was give everybody a quick and dirty way to say, we're all familiar with 97th percentile generally in our area. So what does that look like if you run a quick fire behavior? And what are the numbers that go along with that? So in this case, what we did is um, we pulled the, the data from the closest raw station and it uh, calculates what that 97th percentile um, uh, weather parameters are, so what the inputs are for fuel moisture and wind speed, et cetera. And it'll automatically generate a fire behavior uh, run for you. And then you can go ahead and look at that report and it'll show you the breakdown of how, um, of how that, that breaks out for the 97th percentile. So it's a great place to start if you're kind of not sure of what your, what your parameters are. Um, people ask us, can I pick the raw station I use? And the, the answer to that is no at the moment. Um, we hope to be able to maybe do that in the future. Um, we're actually trying to work with uh, the gridded weather um, a data set that's being developed through the National Weather Service, in which case we wouldn't have to rely on individual raw stations. So um, we, rather than change the system around and, 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 and have the effort go into choosing different raw stations. We're hanging out for the uh, gridded weather to come online, which will make make the uh, it won't matter where you click on the map. Um, that gridded weather generates weather based on that on that point. So right now it um, it automatically finds the raw station that's closest to the the center of your landscape and uses that raw station. So think of it really as just a good quick and dirty way to uh, to get a 97th percentile run and then look at that um, look at that report and the outputs for that. Again, that's found in the landscape evaluation part of the IFIDIS planning cycle. These are some of the outputs from the landscape firm probability model. And again, this just came online this summer and Caroline Noble um, and Jennifer Anderson are going to do a webinar, full webinar, just on landscape firm probability. And that's going to be the second webinar in this little series, and that's going to be December 12th at uh, see it, 2 p.m. Mountain Time. So when you registered for this webinar, you also actually registered for the one on the 12th. So we're hoping you guys can make um, make the webinar on the 12th, and that will really dig into how this landscape burn probability model works and how to use it, and um, and then where it leads as we get into risk assessment and um, and some of the exposure analysis and and some other uses. So I'm not going to go into the details of it here, um, but I want to just give you a little a little shot of what what those some of those outputs look like, um, and then explain just a little bit uh, what comes with uh, the burn probability model when you run it. Um, it. A few caveats with burn probability, just in case you want to run off and try this. Um, burn probability takes a while to run, so depending on the size of your landscape and how complex your landscape is. You might submit a run in landscape burn probability. You might not get an answer until the next day. Um, we have limited server, server capacity, so these runs get, it, get put into a queue, and they're run you know, sequentially based on what's in the queue. So we really recommend, if you're just learning this for the first time, start small. The best thing to do is start small, learn, understand what's going on in your landscape, before you submit a really large run. You're gonna be waiting a while if you, uh, if you submit a large run and you run more than one at a time. So just a few cautions there, and I know Caroline and, and Jen will go into that a little bit further, but, um, but it is available. We do want people to use it, but just understand that it is, it is one of those models that's a little more intensive. So, um, so be patient and please look at the, definitely look at the documentation that's in the help on landscape burn probability, there's a lot of great information in there if you're if you're new to that model, which a lot of people are. Okay, one of the other um, things that we wanted to focus on when we were developing IFIDIS was we really wanted to pick the things that um, are hard for people to do, or things that you can't necessarily do anywhere else very easily. And one of those things in talking with folks that do um, NEPA analysis or write specialist reports is comparing fuels treatment alternatives and running different scenarios. Um, so this was our this was this actually was released in April 2017, and it was one of the first um, first 
you know, bigger things that we released in the system. We're actually going to overhaul this over time. Right now, you can only compare two things. You have your original landscape, and then you edit your landscape. You can see you walk um, walk through the tabs here. Um, you edit your landscapes. You can run the basic fire behavior model, um, and then look at the comparison of those after you run that model. And again, like I said, you can only compare two things right now. In the future, we want to be able to compare a lot more things, maybe up to five different alternatives. So we are going to overall overhaul this part of IFTDIS so you can expand on the number of alternatives and hopefully on the number of models that you use. Um, right now, like I said, you can only use the basic um, landscape fire behavior for these alternatives. Um, so anyway, that was the idea, is to walk everybody through a step-by-step -step process on, on uh, getting your landscape, editing your landscape, running the models, and then, and then looking at a comparison. Um, so stay tuned for more on this. We're hoping to do um, a little more of an elaborate uh, comparison, we're calling it a comparison dashboard um, in 2020. So, so stand by, we'll, we'll keep folks um, in tune on, on how, the, how we're tracking on, on that development. But this is a unique feature in IFTDIS. So a lot of people do this in GIS kind of by hand. And this was a, our first stab at, at trying to, to build a workflow for, uh, for these treatment alternatives. This is a little screenshot of some of the reports that you can get out of IFTDIS. I, I mentioned this with the automatic 97th percentile report. Um, this is what some of the outputs look like. You can download any parts of these different reports um, as JPEGs. You can download the actual data if you're looking at the, um, the table of data here. If you want to put it into your own spreadsheet and then make your own graphs and charts, or if you just want to snag a, uh, a quick bar chart to put into a, a report, you can do that. You can do it as a JPEG. You can download the whole report as a PDF. Um, we've got the bar charts, we've got the, uh, the pie charts. And then this one here in the lower right corner is the report that you get when you run that fuels treatment alternative um, workflow. And it, you can see it gives you the comparison here. The blue and the green would be um, before you edit the landscape and then fire behavior after you edit the landscape. So that's what the, uh, that's what the reports look like from the fuels treatment alternative uh, portion of the, that strategic planning part of IFTI does. And these, these reports will be expanded on as you do burn probability. There's reports for burn probability. Um, there's going to re be reports for the stuff that's coming up in the risk assessment, et cetera. So we're always going to have reports coupled with uh, the output that you, that you get in IFTDIS. That's one of the things, again, that we, we identified that that's not something that's easy to do anywhere else. So definitely a, a product that we felt was important for IFTDIS as we move forward with, with uh, future development too. So this is the piece that, um, that Josh is going to go to here in a little demo here in just a few minutes when I wrap this up. Um, and this is our map values. So this is another piece um, moving towards being able to do an exposure analysis and a risk assessment is being able to look at your highly valued resources or assets that are on your landscape and seeing where those um, fit in with any of your uh, fire behavior output, um, just as a communication tool with your partners or, or the public, potentially. Um, so, so uh, Josh is going to walk through the demo on how you actually run this this map values piece in IFTDIS. And the the idea here is that you can you can walk through this, uh, select your different uh, HVRAs that are important to you, and then save that that and use that um, in any other future analysis um, that's, so that way you don't have to keep rebuilding it every time you want to uh, pull up your values. So Josh is going to go into this in a little bit more detail, but that was our most recent release in uh, October. And then one of the last things that people seem to really like about IFTDIS, especially folks who are maybe a little, like, unlike me, who are more advanced GIS type people, um, you can export almost anything out of IFTDIS when it comes to um, your outputs or the landscape data. Um, we export these in multi-band geotiffs, which you can put into Arc, uh, ArcMap, and then do your own analysis if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, if you're going to run the, the desktop version of FlamMap or Farsight, um, these are easily imported imported into those um, into those applications as well. So a lot of people ask us about being able to download and use those. Um, 
use those that data in their own analyses. So we have made that available here, and you can see on the on the bottom left where you do that out of your workspace in IFTDIS. Um, you just go to the download button, and it'll uh, it'll take you to a place where you can save that onto your own uh, hard drive. So that's been a that's been a feature that we hear a lot of a lot of thumbs up about, and we'll try to continue to um, develop that into the future with some of the new features. Okay, so I'm going to spend a couple minutes on what we're doing next. So good old Buzz Lightyear, and um, we're hopefully going to go to infinity, infinity and beyond if we're lucky. And uh, so far, we're set up to do that. So um, let's go to what we're going to do next here. So going into the again, the, I'm going to start with the uh, the FDD fuels planning cycle. As you uh, as you look at the different pieces here. Um, We've got our landscape evaluation uh, piece, which I've showed you um, just to, just as we walked through that, um, and I'm going to check off the ones that we've uh, completed. So we've got we've got the top tier uh, fairly well completed, I think. Um, not to say there won't be future development on those and enhancements, but we're feeling pretty good about where we're, we where we are there. The strategic planning piece, you know, we've got the, some of the developed treatment alternatives, um, and we are going to improve that in the future. Map values. Um, is is looking pretty good, and then uh, modeling burn probability. That was another piece of what we wanted to ensure users could do. And again, we're moving towards being able to do these uh, exposure analyses and this risk assessment work. Um, again, that's not something that's easy to do in other places. Um, so we're hoping that that will really get folks using IFTDIS on a on a unit on a unit level landscape level. Um, to, to try to, to work through some of the risk assessment processes. Um, the, the last piece that's in there, it says comparison dashboard, and that was, that's, the, that's the part that we're hoping to enhance and really build so you can do comparisons of all different kinds, uh, whether that's fuels um, planning in a burn plan or all the way through the risk assessment work. So that, compare, that comparison dashboard will hopefully meet some of those needs. As far as the implementation planning part of IFTDIS, or sorry, that, that's just showing the exposure and the risk assessment coming up. Um, we've also wanted to, again, add that additional um, fire behavior model. And hopefully, like I said, in 2020, we'll be adding, adding the, uh, the flare map uh, minimum travel time or short-term short model, as you, might, as you might know it. And then one of the other parts we want to get to is um, is uh, some enhancement, enhancements with the fuels treatment effectiveness monitoring uh, portion of IFTDIS. Um, that's a re required piece for um, for the federal fire agencies, and that's available in IFTDIS for those folks to their, do their required um, monitoring. We're going to add a few enhancements there. And then the last part of this that we're going to try to work into 2020, and this will go into 2021 and on into the future as well, is um, is, is populating this implementation planning part where, uh, you know, looking at, again, like I said, the dashboard for prescription development for a burn plan, um, and then sort of guiding people on how to use FDDIS to, uh, to use, to, to work with a burn plan, which you can do a lot in, in, in right now, but we hope to add some more features for that down the road as well. And then we do get some questions about smoke modeling and, um, how do we use smoke management within IFTDIS? And that's something down down the road we're going to be working with the air fire group on and um, and coming up with some ways that we can incorporate some of that in IFTDIS. That's probably several years out though, um, uh, not something we're going to be able to get to next year. But we're hope hopefully a few years down the road we'll be working with some of the smoke modeling. So that's sort of in a in a big picture where things are are going next. What I did want to talk about briefly is um, some of this risk assessment and exposure analysis. This is a timeline. Um, in July, we released the burn probability model. Um, in October, we released the map values. Um, right now, as we speak, we're working on the exposure analysis piece. Um, we hope to have that rolled out sometime in January, um, and you'll be able to complete an exposure analysis. And then beginning in, uh, in 2020, we're really going to hit it hard the first half of the year on the risk assessment. So that's, that's where we're going in the early part of 2020. So the exposure analysis is going to sit here in uh, the strategic planning part of IFTDIS. And uh, I'm not going to get a, a, a ton into the details here, but um, we're taking a lot of this work from um, the, the GTR 315. You might be familiar with risk assessment 
um, and how that and how that is being used across across the country. And this exposure analysis is a uh, is one piece of that as we look at how those high valued resources or assets are coupled with uh, the likelihood of wildfire um, and intensity, and and using that to to help identify you know priorities for fuels treatment planning, et cetera. So we hope to have this um, coming out to everybody sometime in January. Not exactly sure when, but definitely in the early part of the year. And then just a few um, snapshots of a preview of what that looks like is, again, walking through the exposure. This is all a mock-up. Um, this isn't available yet, but it will be coming soon. Um, you'll walk through the exposure analysis, basically identifying your HBRAs, using your burn probability outputs, and coupling those together to then um, generate a whole bunch of different reports that will help you analyze um, exposure on your different uh, high valued resources or assets out there the values the things that you care about and then hopefully use that in the discussion on on prioritizing uh, numbers of fuels treatments or where you put them or what types of fuels treatments you use etc and of course that will all roll into um, some of the risk assessment so this is again where we're going with some of the quantitative risk assessment um, we've completed a, uh, some of these boxes here at the top um, the map values piece over here on the left. Again, exposure analysis is coming to you hopefully in January. And then finally, um, the risk assessment part um, in, in, in the early part of 2020. And you can find out some more of this information on the ISU just landing page. Uh, we've got a little flyer available. You can read a little further on the wildfire risk assessment and how that's going to look. And then once we have this uh, further down the road, we'll be doing some more webinars and explaining how uh, risk assessment can be used and how to actually use it. It's probably the most complicated thing uh, by far that we're going to be developing in IFTDIS. So this is under construction right now. And um, if you have further questions, you can you can email us or hit us up in the uh, in the IFTDIS uh, uh, contact uh, button if you if you want to you want to visit with us. You can also post questions in our user forum, and I'll show you where those are at the end. Okay, so that's sort of where, where things are at with FGDIS and where we're going um, in the near future. I want to turn it over to Josh to do a little walkthrough on the map values, and, um, and then we'll take it from there. So let me uh, switch the screen to Josh. If I can get to here. Sounds can you grab? Good. Oh, here we go. Here you go. Come in your way, Josh. Okay. Let me make sure I share the correct screen. Okay. Yeah, and I can let you know uh, what we're seeing. All right. Yeah, it looks like you're pulling up the uh, IFTDIS website and the planning cycle. I am. So that's showing up uh, okay. Yeah, looks uh, good on this smoke. end. Um, and again, if folks have questions, we want to go ahead and have you stick them in the chat box, and I'll try to answer some questions um, as we go along here. And we'll wrap things up. And when we post this webinar to the uh, to the website, I'll have a summary of some of the questions and answers for everybody as well. So if you didn't catch them here, um, you'll be able to check them out um, after. All right, you're looking good, Josh. Go ahead. Oh, great. And one note on the questions, at least on the organizer end, uh, that display is split between chat in one box and questions in another. So uh, you might need to keep an eye on both of those. I discovered that a little bit later, so I answered a few questions in a chunk about halfway through the presentation. Uh, I think I got the context correct on all those, but if not, feel free to jump in at the end of this as well and can follow up. So for map values, I'll go through a demonstration of uh, creating the highly valued resources and assets, uh, viewing those in Workspace and in Map Studio. about that. I'm hiding some other stuff on the other screen, so 
to start. Uh, it's available through the planning cycle and strategic planning. And we can see it's up here at the top level. It's, it's currently not nested in with hazard exposure and risk assessments. Uh, even though the map values is a necessary step uh, that'll be needed to conduct an exposure analysis, it's pretty useful any time that you need to overlay your values with uh, model outputs in Map Studio. So it's just out here in the general strategic planning section. And as soon as I click on this, you can see we're taken to the user interface with Map Studio on the left and our inputs on the right. Uh, to select a geographic extent, we can choose between landscape, landscape burn probability model output, and area of interest. And uh, the reason that area of interest is on there is uh, because unlike landscape or the model outputs, it's, it's not constrained to that 3.5 million acre limit. So you can create a pretty much any size AOI that you'd like, and uh, that would allow you to create a, a very large HVRA set that could encompass uh, multiple forests or multiple parks in a region if you wanted to create a one large master HVRA set that more than one forest or park could use. And for this, I created a burn probability model earlier, so I'll use that as my geographic extent. And with that selected, we can see that the next step is that selecting a primary HVRA category is now active, and it also zoomed to that extent on the map. And all the features in the map are active, so I can change the background map. And uh, if I wanted to turn on that model output in here, I could. So there's a maximum of 10 primary HVRA categories that can be selected. And each of those, you can specify up to 10 sub HVRAs. And we can see here, for example, if I start by selecting air quality, we'll see all the data that matches our extent is displayed. And you can also browse through just reference data or just user data, which is uh, the shapes that I've created in here or uploaded from my computer. Go ahead and select high PM 2.5 emission potential, and you can see it's displayed on the map, as well as added to our pending HVRA set. And you can go through and delete these as well as you're working in here. So if I wanted to remove that, I could just use the delete button to the right of it. In this case, I'll, I'll keep it though. And I'm going to look at ecosystem function here because this has a couple different kinds of reference data in here. Uh, these first three with the IFTDIS icon next to them, those are the IFTDIS reference layers that we've had in the system since 2017. Uh, the rest that have the CONUS icon next to them, those are HVRA national reference layers uh, that were added to IFTDIS this year to support the map values function. And those are based on work from Dylan et al. And we've got that in the references right now. It's currently in press, so we don't have the paper to link to it yet. But as soon as that becomes available, we'll add that in the Help Center reference and section so you can get more documentation on that. As I select these, they'll become viewable in the map. And 
we do have a metadata link for pretty much all of these, so you can look at specific metadata for each one. And you can also add your own either primary HPRA categories or sub HPRAs. So if I wanted to create one for cultural resources, for example, as a primary HPRA, I could do that. And it will show the entire list of reference layers that match our landscape extent. So I could put those under our custom primary HPRA category, or we could choose our own shapes. And just to show the map function in here, if I wanted to add a shape to use for this right now in, in this interface, I could. So for example, if I wanted to add a polygon around an archaeological site and use that in this HVRA set, that can be done. I can see that that's now available in our list of sub HVRAs. I'm going to scroll down here so we can see what we've selected so far uh, the list of primary HVRAs and sub HVRAs under those. And if you do create a custom uh, sub HVRA, does require a short name to put in, and that's just for use in reports. Uh, as these get picked up and used in charts and graphs, having a, a short name that you specify of 10 characters or less just kind of makes sure that it always properly displays in those. And it's displaying with the name that you choose, so it makes sense to you instead of uh, having the system truncate it and maybe not being a name that's recognizable to you. So once this is set up, we can go ahead and give it a name and save. And before going on, I'll just point out one thing since it's popping up in here, this list of sub HRAs that did not intersect, we can pull this up and it will show all of the reference sub HRAs that did not intersect with our geographic extent, which can be useful if you expect to see something on this list and it's not there, you can always check to make sure uh, that it, it could be outside of landscape extents. So go ahead and hit save. And as soon as I do that, we see a confirmation message appears that will show us the folder the HVRA set is stored in, and 50 disks will automatically store it in the same folder as either the landscape model output or area of interest that you used for the geographic extent. And from here, I could clear this form, uh, you get rid of all this information and start a new HVRA set or if I needed to go in and make a change, all these fields are still active. So if I decided no, I, I don't want the all positive decreasing ecosystem function sub HVRA in here, I could delete that and click update and get a confirmation of that here. That will override our HVRA set with our change. So to put these together is fairly straightforward in here. Uh, there is also guidance in the user interface, uh, little question marks with popovers on more information from the Help Center to get you through if you're stuck. I'm going to click our linked folder and just look at our file in my workspace. You can see we're in the pay it folder, which is the same.
same one that my model output's located in. As far as file options, we've got some pretty common ones here, the delete, copy and edit, make edits. You can also see a pop-up list of what sub-HVRAs and primary HVRAs are in here. And view in Map Studio. And just to show the other way to pull this up, if you're already working in Map Studio, I'll go ahead and pull that up from the Add Layers. So I'll just get a fresh Map Studio session going. We'll also add the model output that I had based these on, so we can take a look at that too while we're working in here. So, for example, I've got a burn probability output up here, and if you wanted to overlay that HVRA set, you can go to Add Layers, click the My Layers tab, and I'm going to shorten this list. First by filtering by map extent, and then by filtering just by HVRA sets. And there's the one we just created. I've got another one in here with more features, so I'm going to click that just so we have a little bit more to look at. And close, add layers. And by default, it turns these all on. So they're all turned on and listed in here which is helpful, but a little bit overwhelming at first. So I'll typically go in and uh, uh, collapse these layers and turn them off. That way I can start with the model output and just progress through these different HVRA sets. So for example, I see a, a region of relatively high burn probability in here. And from here, I can start to turn each of these on. Uh, for example, the infrastructure HVRA feature. You can see that there's a few uh, forest service buildings in here. Uh, communication tower off to the west, but that's a little ways away. Also go through if I were to switch on the uh, air quality, high PM 2.5 emission potential. You can see that's a lot of this landscape, but also specifically in this this area that we're looking at. Same for wildlife and ecosystem function, and we could also turn off each of these sub layers as well. So that's a, a really easy way to just start to pull up these values overlaid with the model outputs in Map Studio and, and really start to see what HVRA sets are around your your model outputs. And this can also be used if you want to zoom to a specific part of the landscape. You can always start with your HVRA set uh, if you have that handy and create model outputs around that. So that can be another way to use it kind of as a bookmark in a way in Map Studio. So that is HVRA sets. Is that a good place to stop, Kim, or should I mention yeah. anything about the exposure analysis work? Um, still, I think you can leave it, at, leave it at that. Yeah, let's okay. go ahead and leave it at that for now. Um, I thought if you uh, if you want to just real quick, just for this. Uh, for the HBRA and the map values, just real quick, maybe show the uh, the online help system and just how that's structured really quickly. 
just so folks can um, can see where some of this, uh, you know, the metadata on the reference data sets and uh, just sort of how we, we pulled a lot of this together. Just want to show everybody in the help where, where they can find that. <clears throat> oh, for sure. So for each of these sub HVRAs, I should click the more options to the right. There'll be a option for metadata. And that will open up in a new tab. In this one, uh, ecosystem function, we have that metadata page directly in Help Center. Most of our sub HVRAs, we have a standalone metadata page for it. So, Transmission lines, for example, if we were to click metadata, we would be redirected to that metadata page. And this is more similar to what most of these look like. So that's a quick way to pull up a specific set in Map Studio and have it open in a new tab without losing the place in the system that you're working in. Yeah, that's great, Josh. We've got a, a ton of help and, and some tutorials and and different things that, that you if you're if you like like Josh said, if you get stuck, that that really is the first place to go. He's Josh is he's our uh our developer of, of the online help system and has done a great job um being quite thorough in there. So we really encourage everybody to look at the at the help. If you're looking at documentation or just want some um, I'm not quite sure what button to push here or there. That's that's definitely the place to go. Um, so that's that's great, Josh. That's a great overview of the uh, of the map values. There was a couple questions in here. I thought I'd just mention because um, other folks might have the same question. Um, this demo that Josh just just did is currently available in IFTDES. So you can do this. It's available now. You go to strategic planning, uh, then to the map values card, and you can work through through this. Uh, you know this this workflow here to to save your set of HVRAs. So that is available right now. Um, another question that came in was about sharing data and sharing folders within IFTDIS. Um, we're currently not able to do that. However, it's at the very top of our list. We've had a lot of requests for people asking about sharing data amongst users, um, and we're looking at the details of how to do that and um, we we might start kind of small on that one where um, you could share your data set with another user. They would then pull it into their own workspace and use it from there. So we're working on the the particulars of that, but that's definitely on, at the at, at the top of our list. Collaboration and and sharing data with your partners and and your co or your cooperators is we know is very important to people. So so it's coming. Hang in there with us. We'll keep you posted on on um on how that gets and how that evolves over time but um, we're definitely looking to to make that possible okay so i i'm going to grab the screen back um really quick josh and then just want to uh um sort of wrap it up for folks since we're just about at the top of the hour um i want to just show everybody um okay so let me make sure I'm showing my screen here hopefully i am showing the empty disk home screen is what I want to be showing. Is that what you're seeing, Josh? Seeing some of it. Would it be possible to make it a little bit larger? Um, I think I've got it as big as, let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. That's a bit better. How's that? Than what? Maybe a little bit better? So, yeah, yeah, sorry, that it's a little bit good. small. That's in full screen okay. now. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to walk everybody through a few places. We talked about the user support up here, the help center. Uh, we've got videos. Um, you can always look at our next uh, set of webinars and training that's coming up. This is our scheduled and recorded webinars. This is where this recording will live. Um, once we, um, we, we finish it up and edit it a little bit, we'll post it here under the recorded webinars piece. Um, and then, of course, our, um, we've got our next scheduled webinar on uh, December 12th, looking at landscape bird probability. Um, we always post every, anything that's new. Um, will be posted here on the landing page. 
You can see if you want to read more about map values, um, this is the flyer that we generated on uh, understanding how to use map values. You can download this if you're going to a meeting um, or just want to share with other people that might be interested. You can grab those PDFs. Uh, we put a video on here and then just a guide to the Help Center to get you started with that newest feature. And then some of the other things that folks are generally interested, which is this risk assessment work, you know, where are we going with risk assessment? Um, firm probability modeling, like I said, is one of the more complicated things that we have in the system. So you can find a lot of those things on the home page here. Um, the, other, the other thing I wanted to point out is we, the we want to hear from you piece. And we're going to be adding to this. This is where I said I, I, I'd love to hear what people are using IFTI this for. So one of the things we're going to add to this uh, landing page is a place for you all to communicate with us on, on those particular projects that you're working on and, and, um, and, uh, and share with us how you're actually using IFTI disk because we'd really like to, to hear about that. We also have our user forum. Uh, if you click on that forum, you'll be able to see we both may have a question and answers section and then an ideas exchange. So if you just have a question and you can read through all the topics that are in here, um, feel free to read what's already been posted. We should have, we try to answer these as soon as possible. Um, and then if you have an idea, like, hey, I'd re it'd be really cool if Ifty Disk did this in the future. Uh, for example, that, that question on, will you be able to share uh, folders with people? Um, if you go into this, um, this piece of the user forum, you can post some of those things there. And we'll get back to you, whether that's on our list or not, or if that's, hey, that's a great idea. Um, we're gonna, we wanna contact you for further information. So please use this portal. We, um, right now you actually have to have a separate login. We don't have this linked into the IFTI disk login right now, which is not ideal, but we hope to change that in the future. So, uh, but you can just uh, get, a, get a little profile for the support center and then you can communicate through the ideas exchange. And we'd really like people to do that. Um, that would be a, a big help to us in the future. We're also going to be putting together a survey. This is a survey that we did. Um, this was actually done last year. And uh, we, we, want, we want folks to communicate with us as far as how is this just working for you? Um, so give us some feedback. And this, this survey is still open. Um, I'd love to get more folks um, using it. So please feel free to, to click on that and enter some, enter some thoughts for us. And then I'm going to have a new one uh, coming up soon, which will look more at that's current, the current IFTI disk. I'm going to have another survey coming out about the future development of IFTI disk and what things that we could potentially develop that might be most useful um, in your work. So we want to hear from you on that as well. Um, so I think that that pretty much covers what we wanted to go over today. Um, like I said, we've got um, the next webinar coming up on December 12th on burn probability. Um, please log in and join us for that one. That will be recorded also and will be posted to the website. So if you're not able to make it, you can watch the recording. And uh, we plan to have a lot more coming in 2020 once we ex uh, release the exposure analysis. We'll do a webinar on that in January. And then uh, as we get further down the road on risk assessment, we'll be communicating with everybody on, um, on how we're going to be uh, rolling out the risk assessment. So thanks everybody for attending and um, we hope you have a fantastic Thanksgiving and a great holiday um, season and um, we're really excited about next year. So stick with us and, and keep, keep telling us what you think. Uh, we really want to build this application based on what users need um, in, in your job. That's, that's what we're here for. That's why we're doing this. So, so don't, uh, don't be afraid to reach out. All right. Thanks again and uh, have a great holiday.